Tongue plucked raw from gaping moor, Blood from vein let fall like rain. Behold these eyes your bloody prize, And now the fall from vaulted hall, These bones, this flesh, consume it all. Pazuzu, Pazuzu, Pazuzu. Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel or backing me on Patreon and subscribing to me here as I upload at least twice a week. In the folklore and ancient religions of our world, the demon Pazuzu does not appear in myth until Assyria's rise in the first millennium BC, making him a member of the ancient Mesopotamian religion. His name is an Akkadian word and he was regarded as the king of all demons of the air. His brother, Humbaba, the terrible, was a mighty colossus, a giant set by the god Enlil to guard the the divine cedar forest, the home of the gods, and these two brothers were born of a god known as Hanbi, a being of pure evil. Pazuzu has a somewhat variable physical form, always an assortment of animal parts, a humanoid body with the head of a lion, dog, or some sort of beaked and toothed beast, the talons of an eagle, two pairs of feathered wings, and the wicked scorpion's tail. In ancient art, he is always depicted with his right hand raised and his left hand lowered, though I don't know why. He was most certainly a horrible being in Mesopotamia. He was the demon of the southwest wind that brought famine, locusts, and diseases. However, he served another role that saw him included in protective amulets and even represented by gargoyle-like effigies of his snarling face, placed in homes where he could be seen by those outside looking into the dwelling. The reason for this curious practice was that he was said to scare off a worst evil, the malicious goddess Lamashtu, who was believed to cause harm to mothers and infants, particularly during childbirth. Infant mortality was high in the ancient world, no greater pain than that exists, and thus the unlikely popularity of Pazuzu, who, as a side benefit, drove away evil, other evil spirits, before protecting humans against assorted misfortunes. I guess, in the balance of things, famine and plagues of locusts were not so bad in ancient Mesopotamia. In Dungeons and Dragons, Pazuzu made his first appearance in the first edition Monster Manual 2, published in 1983. Pazuzu is nothing but a force of pure evil, a powerful demon called the Prince of the Lower Aerial Kingdoms. He rules the skies above all layers of the abyss, and is sometimes called Pazreel, uh, such as his manifestation in the Greyhawk setting, or Pazuzius in a mockery of the angelic celestials whom he detests. He appears in the Planes of Chaos box set for the Planescape setting published in 1995. He is also covered in some detail in issue 329 of the Dragon magazine published in March 2005, and I'll be quoting that Demonomicon of Eggwheel article a lot in this video, as it's mo the most complete body of lore on the demon that you can find. He is known to shift his form frequently, so there are many accounts of what he looks like. In the Fiendish Codex, Hordes of the Abyss for 3.5 edition, it has this to say about him on page 76. Although he's a tall, 7 foot tall, well proportioned man, this figure's demonic features cannot be ignored. His powerful, bird-like talons scrape the floor as he approaches, and four feathered wings shine with oil and writhe with smoke on his back. His head combines the features of a handsome man and a feral hawk, his cruel hooked beak filled with forests of needle teeth. He often carries a plus five great sword of speed that inflicts additional damage to any target that is of a lawful alignment. His head is larger in proportion to his body than a human's would be, and his eyes glow red. He may or may not be wearing any other sort of garment, belt, ring, neck, talk, and so on. If he is, it is most certainly a powerful magic item of some kind. Seems like a pretty standard demon lord so far, but there is a deep secret about Pazuzu that he largely keeps hidden, even from the other powers of the abyss. So sit tight, grab a beverage, we're about to get deeply nerdy. It is not common knowledge in the lower plains that Pazuzu is not a Tanari demon. He is much older than that entire race of demon kind. Pazuzu was one of the very few Oberth lords who survived the transition between multiverses through the Far Realm, relatively intact. He is thus as old as the Abyss itself, and really was ancient before the Oberth ever left their own dying multiverse. The Fiendish Codex Horde of the Abyss has this to say about Pazuzu on page 77. Pazuzu is a unique example of survival in the Abyss. Originally one of the more powerful Oberth Lords, his independence was a constant thorn in the Queen of Chaos's side. 
As it turned out, Pazuzu has since evolved with the new rule of the Abyss. While he is still in Oberth, he is accepted by the Tanari and represents a sort of missing link between the two races. Due to his duality, duality of nature, Pazuzu's form has taken on a less terrible appearance with the passing of eons, and his form of madness ability that's common to all Oberth has transformed into his current aura of servile uh, status of avians. He has also gained several Tanari-like qualities, including the ability to summon the Tanari. Although Pazuzu commands the respect and loyalty of all beings, evil beings that fly in the abyssal skies, he is rarely forced to call upon these creatures. Perhaps alone in the abyss, Pazuzu has no active enemies. The other demon lords seem to begrudgingly award him the skies above their realms, if only because there seems to be little there for them to claim. Grast alone has been known to speak ill of Pazuzu, yet he has never taken direct ag- action against him. The one demon lord that could be counted as his enemy is the wretched and deformed Lamashtu, although the queen of monstrous births has been imprisoned by Pazuzu on his chosen plane of Torim- uh, Torimor for countless ages, so she's hardly a threat to anyone, uh, let alone the demon prince. I'll talk much more in detail about that later. Pazuzu does not just lust for the rule of uh, realm in the abyss, although he nonetheless uh, controls the 503rd layer of the abyss and his presence is nearly constant on the first layer, nor does he wish to rule over his fellow demons. His goals are higher. He lusts for innocence, purity and honesty. These sweet nectars are his greatest vice and he consumes them. He leaves bitterness, cruelty and wickedness in the shells of those he's corrupted. Since these qualities are so alien in in the abyss he logically has little interest in what dwells therein and instead turns his attention to the prime material plane pazuzu has tested his ability to manifest on material plane worlds without drawing the undue attention of gods who protect them for some time in that time he has mastered the art of telling mortals what they think they want to hear Pazuzu's cults start with a single soul who cries out to the demon prince for aid. Pazuzu gives them that, then this aid, and those who call on him then grow dependent on his aid. They crave the power that his touch can bring. Within a year, those who have called upon him invariably join or found a new cult dedicated to his teachings, where they seek to capture and convert new innocents to his vile worship. Clerics of Pazuzu have access to the domains of air, chaos, evil, and temptation. His symbol is a twisted bird talent, and I'll be talking about their cult and their activities in much more detail later. Pazuzu answers the call of creatures of good and law in preference to others. The more pure of heart the being asking is for his aid, the more likely he is to grant it, and his power to cast the wish spell is just a tip of his potential boons. He has been alive and amassed vast fortunes and countless treasures across the multiverse for hundreds of thousands of years. What is most startling is that for someone like a desperate lawful good paladin, he will ask for nothing in return for his mighty gifts. It's just enough that the paladin has asked him. In stark contrast, if a chaotic evil pirate called out to Pazuzu, he might appear only to horrifically torture and maim the shrieking mortal, bellowing that all the gifts of evil have already been bestowed upon the wretch, and they merely lack the wits to use their gifts. You see, Pazuzu truly despises the good and lawful beings of the multiverse, He plays the long game. Merely being asked by a lawful good paladin for aid is the first and most delicious step in Pazuzu sinking his vile talons into that person's soul. But it goes much deeper than that. Now stop and consider this for a moment. This is not a devil of the nine hells. There is no divine pact that applies rules to how this temptation plays out. Pazuzu is a demon, an extremely powerful one, who has his eyes fixed on the prime material plane and the downfall of all living beings. He is a demon that acts like a devil, and that is a very dire threat to all mortal life. He's not interested in the fighting between the other demon lords. He's not about to be drawn into the eternal stalemate of the blood war. He has cultivated contacts and networks within the diverse ranks of the Ugloths, the Night Hags, the Demodans, and other populations of the Lower Plains, in very powerful circles. Unlike any other demon lord, he can travel the multiverse freely. Pazuzu is an Oberth Lord. His eyes are set on the great prize, the very multiverse itself. His game plan is long indeed. His overall objective is kind of like someone terraforming a world, except Pazuzu is terraforming souls, as many as he can, over an eternity of time. His objective is to destroy the balance of good and evil, law and chaos in the multiverse, and transform it into a completely mutable realm that he can rule as a god. Everything else is just a hobby to him. Uh, The blood war, the demon, rival demon lords, they're mere distractions beneath his concern. 
As he's able to plane shift anywhere, Pazuzu spends a great deal of time away from the abyssal plane that he rules, and a lot of the time uh, is spent on the first layer of the abyss. I will quote from the Fiendish, Fiendish Codex for this part. The top layer of the abyss is Pazunia, it's actually named after him, also known as the Plane of Infinite Portals, or the Palace of 1001 Closets. It is a realm of windswept barrens and jagged tors, flickering with swarms of winged demons. An oppressive red sun, heavy with infinite age, bathes the layer in sweltering heat and harsh light. Angry shadows curtain the plains in places, concealing hidden menace, and everywhere are massive pits that plunge into deeper layers of terror. The pits are portals to the deeper layers of the, of the abyss, so they are, those who descend into them soon find themselves in another abyssal layer. Most of these pits are two-way portals, but some are one-way, leaving no means of return. Leaping into a pit without knowing where it leads is a good way as any to commit suicide in Pazunia, for the pits often lead to inhospitable layers filled with deadly environmental dangers. Some of the most remote layers of the abyss do not actually reach Pazunia at all, and are inaccessible from there, only accessible from stable gates on lower planes of existence. On the edges of the Great Pits crouch massive iron fortresses, relics of the Oberths now inhabited by the mighty Tanari lords who have not yet mastered the power and mustered the forces to bend an entire layer to their wills. These warlike scheming lords use special chambers within the fortresses to project themselves through the astral plane and into material worlds, where they attempt to sway events and attract followers and cultists. When so engaged, their physical forms are rendered helpless, protected only by the iron fortresses of the Oberinths and the Demon Lord's own hordes of servitor cre creatures and pact gained allies. The armies of the Abyss continually clash with each other as the lesser Demon Lords jockey for position. They clash too with invading armies of devils from Bartor, for the Lair of Bazunia is one of the f primary fronts of the Blood War. The methodical Batizu know, as the Oberinths before them knew, that to control Pazunia is to control the whole of the Abyss. Not all visitors to Pazunia come to fight, because Pazunia is a gateway to most of the Abyss. The layer draws merchants, explorers, and occultists from around the multiverse, attracting the most diverse pilgrims of anywhere in the lower plains, let alone the Abyss. The layer is self-contained, but so large that huge sections of it remain essentially unexplored. If one walks far enough towards the horizon, they eventually find themselves on the bordering plane of Pandemonium, or Hades, depending on the direction they walk. These travelling in other directions reach the edge or the layer and are teleported back to the opposite edge, often without knowing that they've moved, so it's very hard to figure out where exactly you're going. Due to this lack of discernible borders, maps of Pazunia seldom attempt to encompass the whole layer, but instead focus upon a smaller section bounded by the iron fortresses of locally influential demon lords. More chaotic evil petitioners manifest as mains on Pazunia than any other layer of the abyss. Local demons hunt these creatures for food or press them into war bands, driving vast herds of petitioners through the pit gates and into the deeper abyss. Some remain on Pazunia to marshal the defences of demon lords inhabiting iron fortresses. Demons view these pitiful creatures as little more than living shields and sacrifice them with impunity, knowing that they'll just reform. Many mains willingly flee down unexplored pits merely to escape their pursuers. Molly Day press gangs wander the lair, picking off stragglers and collaring them to the town of Styros, where they depart upon the river Styx to the lower planet battlefields of the Blood War. The massive two-headed Tanari seldom take on demon lords entrenched in iron fortresses, but they eagerly thrust wandering unaffiliated demons into their press gangs, bellowing their relentless call to battle. Molly Day are also tasked with provisioning the army and demand tribute from all they encounter. Those who can't give it are immediately conscripted, conscripted and sent to the staging town of Styros and then on to the raging wars of the Lower Plains. A surprising number of merchants, mortals, and outsiders alike brave the treacherous plane of infinite portals, because Pazunia's gates lead to unparalleled business opportunities. Those who fly the flag of the Dark Prince Grast enjoy the best protection against banditry, but even this is far from foolproof. Pazuzu, the lord of the Lower Aerial Kingdoms, has ruled the skies of Pazunia since before the fall of his Oberinth fellows. Countless Chasmae, Vrox, and other flying demons that perch atop the jagged tours and pinnacles of Pazunia pay homage to Pazuzu and occasionally snatch travellers from the surface as sacrifices to their prideful lord. You could probably find many statues and things of ancient origin towards Pazuzu on this plane. Lawful good characters travelling on Pazunia are at high risk of attracting Pazuzu's attention each day they remain on the layer, for the winged demon is always on the lookout for new innocents to corrupt 
and ultimately devour. In some cases, Bazuzu waits until goodly characters are in a difficult bind before sweeping in at the last minute and offering to help the unfortunate characters in exchange for some unspeakable service. He pays little attention to the other demon lords of the lair and seldom interferes with their business or their iron fortresses. Of course, the dire circumstances the character find themselves in is most likely directly orchestrated by Pazuzu for the express purpose of forcing the victims to seek him out for aid. It has a lot to do with the power of free will, of course. Otherwise, Pazuzu would long ago have developed a machine to just transform mortals into dream demons directly. But it's never that simple. Although, it, he's got a powerful artifact, a throne, that can do that if you sit on it uninvited. It comes down to choices. Mortals always have the option to just die rather than to succumb to evil and temptation. But Pazuzu delights in a large number of them who would rather turn to evil in small steps until it's just too late for them and they can then be slaughtered and swell the ranks of the abyss, adding to its combined energy and swelling its cancerous corruption of the multiverse. Encountering Pazuzu will be through the character finding one of the many ways to contact Pazuzu and call out for his aid. These are not hard to find. Obviously, Pazuzu is only too happy to offer his services. There are many first-hand accounts by the most noble and trustworthy heroes that they managed to escape the abyss thanks to Pazuzu, and it cost them nothing at all. Ah, but if the character is not lawful good, and any request made to Pazuzu will shift them one step closer towards chaotic evil. And this is not magic. This is their choice, their free will. So encounters with Pazuzu, when not on his terms, are highly ill-advised. First, he has a retinue of six powerful Baylors who the characters will have to get through before they can even reach Pazuzu. And while the characters are fighting them, Pazuzu will be breathing swarms of abyssal locusts or swarm, a swarm of abyssal ants and launching spells from a distance, plus summoning in other minions to add to the fight. He can call on the favour of another Balor. I like to think this would be like uh, when the first Balor gets killed in the fight, Pazuzu opens a gate and another Balor appears, appearing eager to get into the action, with Pazuzu saying, Finally, you have your chance to earn your place at my side, at Crocs or Morks. Destroy these mortals! Pazuzu can also summon a handful of rocks, as well as fiendish versions of rocks, griff, uh, rocks, as well as fiendish versions of rocks, griffins and harpies, pretty much any winged monster you wish to throw into the fight. The longer the characters are delayed by the Baylor bodyguards, the worse this fight is going to get for them. I have taken a look at the first two listings for Pazuzu in the homebrew section of D&D Beyond. They're pretty far off the mark, with a lot of Pazuzu's best features just completely missing, so I don't recommend those. He is a medium-sized foe, with 551 hit points, and an armor class of 22. Are you taking notes? You should be. 30 foot speed on the ground, and 90 foot flight speed, and 60 foot swim speed. He uses his wings in the water as well as in the air. He really spends much of his time in the air, or at least hovering, and he very rarely touches the ground. The only stat below 30 is his strength, which is 26. He's plus 14 to dexterity on constitution saves and plus 17 to charisma saves. He has plus 10 to arcana, insight and perception checks, immunity to fire, poison and lightning. He's resistant to cold, acid, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical weapons, shrugs off spell damage and effects below level 3, and always rolls to save versus magic with advantage. He has regeneration of only 5 hit points per round, and legendary resistance 3 times per day. He has true sight and dark vision to 120 feet, and telepathy out to 200 feet. His usual preference is to avoid melee combat and unleash spells. He casts as a 20th level wizard, but has such mastery that he can cast Plane Shift at will without needing the physical component. He can also cast Wish at least once per day. Pazuzu makes three great sword attacks plus one other action, each uh, either commanding a minion or unleashing a spell or using one of his two breath weapons during his turn. He also gets three actions he uses at the end of other creatures' turns during the combat round. His great sword is Adamantine, plus five, confers the effect of haste enchantment on him and automatically crits against lawful creatures. He is plus 15 to hit, 5 foot reach, and the greatsword automatically crits against objects thanks to the adamantine property. It inflicts 2d6 plus 15 slashing damage plus 68 force damage. That's 6d8, not 68. This weapon is actually a magically crafted sword made from the wing feather of a tremendously powerful avian demon that Pazuzu kicked the crap out of a long time ago. He can stow and retrieve this sword from a pocket dimension space whenever he wants. 
He has an aura that is highly effective against any creature that has a natural flight speed. This aura of command requires Pazuzu to look at a flight capable creature who then has to make a DC 20 wisdom saving throw or be dominated by him. Good aligned creatures have advantage on the save, but evil aligned creatures are mark, uh, making that saving throw with disadvantage, so good luck. Pazuzu gets to command his minions at least once per round, either on his turn or during another creature's turn as one of his legendary actions. His breath weapons are impressive. He can release a swarm of insects. Well, actually it's six swarms of insects that stay in the combat area and act like five foot spaces filled with pain. They must be adjacent to each other but can move around on their own during combat. Just use the swarm of insects wasps listing for the stats for this. Instead of the six swarms, Pazuzu can also choose to release a single medium swarm of much more dangerous abyssal ants, which are like a swarm of beetles, but bigger, stronger, and can spit balls of acid that act just like Melf's acid arrow spells, except they do 2d8 acid damage and splash adjacent targets for 2d4 acid damage. The abyssal ants also have both claw and pincer bite attacks and can lock onto a target and grapple attack, dogpiling into a helpless humanoid and basically melting them. His second breath weapon is a 70 foot cone of poisonous acidic vapor. Dexterity save DC 19 for half damage. Full damage is 24 D6 and results in additional saving throw, DC 19 constitution saving throw, or the victim is also poisoned. If they fail to make that constitution saving throw at the end uh, to end the poisoned condition on their next turn, they get a level of exhaustion on top of it. Thankfully, it doesn't get any worse, but that's pretty nasty, all things considered. Meanwhile, Pazuzu is raking with his talons, slicing and dicing with his sword, actively cutting opponent's weapons into little pieces with his adamantian greatsword, flying up into the air, unleashing lightning bolts, power words, cloud kill, illusions, and who knows what else, and summoning in more demons and fiendish winged monsters to add to the general chaos. If things get a little bit dangerous for him, he just plain shifts out of there. One thing about Pazuzu is that uttering his name three times does actually form a link between him and whatever creature said the name three times. During the next 60 seconds, no matter where he is in the multiverse, Pazuzu can plane shift to that target unerringly, using his power to examine the being, knowing exactly what their alignment is, detecting their thoughts, rolling his insight skill check with advantage. He will then ask why the mortal has called on him. If the mortal is not chaotic evil, Pazuzu will almost always provide the form of assistance that is asked for, and in doing so, the creatures will shift toward uh, one more step towards evil and chaotic alignment. So he gets around the multiverse quite a lot. I'll talk about how he helps others in just a moment. Also, I'll talk about the cults in the material plane in just a moment. But first, he does control an entire layer of the abyss, the 503rd layer, called Torimor. This is a nightmare realm for any creature that can't fly. I'll paraphrase the description from the Demonomicon of Igwilf. Few know that Pazuzu keeps a lair deep within the abyss, filled with his endless lifetime's worth of accumulated treasures that would make any dragon whimper with jealousy. The Realm of Toromor. Pazuzu's attitude towards it is best described as a jealous neglect. He often loathes spending time in Toromor, yet is quick to come to its defense if even the slightest rumbling that another demon lord might be hatching plans against it. Toromor is a tangled nest of beams and perches, rooks and pinnacles, bridges and arches, connected by writhing ropes and jangling chains. Some regions are filled with small structures with stairs and ladders, places for guests, prisoners to stay. The entire structure seems solid enough. Anyone who falls, knocked from its perches, will fall to their eventual death below, broken, shattered or impaled on more bridges and pinnacles lower still. Offal and waterfalls frothing from larger, more solid sections of the realm tumble forever, crumbling to dust or drifting away in noxious vapour long before they finish their plunge. The truth is, Torimvor has no true base, it just seems to have countless apexes. The millions of spires of the massive structure dominate the horizon in every direction. Some of these spires are little more than a skeletal framework haunted by chasmes, vrocks and ansu demons native to this realm. Ansu look a lot like a jet black, four winged, lion faced griffin the size of a bull elephant. Other spires are actual fortresses. Some are lairs of Pazuzu's favourite minions, his bailors, not yet members of his personal retinue, for example. Others are prisons. One in particular is quite important. The location called Onstraka's Nest is a constantly growing and crumbling sphere 
of timber, bones, earthbergs, and pillars of hundreds of miles in diameter, and impaled on a gleaming spire of sweaty blue metal. This massive nest swarms with all manner of flying demons, although chasmes and rocks are the most commonly seen. These demons scavenge loose objects from elsewhere in Tongaroa, Toramor, using the raw materials to expand the nest, even as it crumbles apart in other places, falling away to infinity below. It is said that the fiend that lurks in the nest's centre is the brood queen of all that flies and flops through the abyssal skies, and thus the original source of all the rocks and chasme in the abyss. This is obviously not true, but remember, knowledge about the abyss is really sketchy and hard to come by without great peril. Rumours also hold that the nest was once the place he and his consort dwelt, but now is a prison built to contain the forgotten demon queen, Lamashtu, who once held Pazuzu's favour. Pazuzu himself never speaks of Onstraka's nest, nor can any on Toramor recall him ever having paid a visit there, yet the fact that he allows the demons to constantly tear apart his massive realm to build additions to it speaks volumes of its importance it holds to him. The reason for this is simple enough. Lamashtu betrayed Pazuzu and seized control of Toramor once, long ago, so Pazuzu ate her eyes and imprisoned she who erases, the queen of monstrous births and deformity. She's been impaled on that blue metal spire deep within Onstraker's nest ever since, screaming out for help, but nobody can hear her, which is just as well, because she's the only being in the multiverse who knows Pazuzu's true name, which is what she used to abuse and to betray him. She's described as a wretched and deformed hag, well known for her bottomless hunger for the bones of pregnant mothers and newborn babies. The location that Pazuzu frequents on Toramore is the Lord's Rook, a massive open cathedral atop the tallest spire on the plain, built to accommodate those who can fly and mock those who cannot. There can be uh, found the massive gilded and huge ruby-studded rock's claw called the Blinding Claw. This is a major artifact bound to Pazuzu that he can call to him across the plains and that will appear next to him that he then uses as a perch, floating fixed and largely immobile in the air. He has several powers, uh, such as, well, that granted to him by this artifact, such as granting spells such as enlarged blindness, clairvoyance, blasphemy, meteor swarm, reverse gravity, and probably quite a few others known only to Pazuzu. When he's not present in the Lord's Rook, this lair is guarded by the same supersized granddaddy of all Ansu demons, who is the same one Pazuzu took the feather from to make his wicked greatsword. There's also some rumour, which has always sparked the interest and ire of the demon Lord Grast, that there is some other artifact within the Lord's Rook that grants Pazuzu his remarkable power to plane shift at will, anywhere within the multiverse. Ooh, I have some very one very juicy bit of lore about that as well, I will save that for last. <clears throat> How Pazuzu helps others. Again, I'll read from the Demonomicon of Igwilf. Pazuzu desires innocence, purity, and honesty. To him, these are sweet nectars and intoxicating liqueurs fine enough to harvest personally. Pazuzu seeks out the noble paladin, the laughing child, the toiling honest peasant. These are his vineyard. He takes from them what makes them strong, and what he excretes back into their hollow shells is bitter, cruel, and wicked. The very act of corrupting of the spirit and the slaughter of virtue is Pazuzu's finest addiction. He has spent eons to perfect the methods of his cultivation. Often the temptations he offers mortals spread out over generations, and he watches silently from above as families slowly succumb. What might have seemed an idle evil to a hard-working cobbler is the seed, and his grandchildren and great-grandchildren are the fertile soil in which Pazuzu's wickedness grows. Trace the genealogy of the brutal despot the sadistic general, or the remorseless killer back far enough, and chances are one can pinpoint the genesis of his family's spiral into depravity, a genesis born of knighted wings and poison promises to a desperate fool. When these seeds wither and die, as all things that consume themselves must end, Pazuzu appears one last time to his hateful students and plucks from them their eyes, so the last thing they see is the true cruelty of their beloved patron's evil. It is said that those whose eyes Pazuzu feeds on do not move on to a better world in death. Rather, they become hollow spirits bound to Pazuzu's lusts, cursed forever to watch from behind his red, baleful eyes as he feeds and feeds again on what they once held so dear. Although he feeds on purity and honesty, innocence and such, he steers clear of the heavenly realms because these places can't be corrupted by him. Not yet, anyway. He's plenty of food and fun in the prime material plane anyway. It keeps him endlessly busy. Pazuzu's cult generally follows the same path from creation to destruction. Unlike most demon princes, Pazuzu usually takes an active role in the cult's early formation. 
Each Pazuzu cult starts with the same seed, a desperate plea for aid by someone who has learned Pazuzu's name. Often these pleas are born of true and honest need, a sickly farmer in need of a good harvest, or a desperate warrior faced with insurmountable odds in defense of their homeland. These people aren't evil. Their greatest sin is foolishness. What they, when they call on Pazuzu, he usually grants their desires without attempting to pervert the results or twist the meaning of the request. His methods are far more insidious. He only asks that his name not be repeated to others, assuring the mortal that his gifts are for them and them alone. Many of his cultists don't know his identity, while others worship him under other names, such as Pazrael or Gluolanda. The desperate mortal's sudden turn of luck always manifests in some way that makes it obvious that more than mere skill and hard work are responsible. Pazuzu knows that where there is one desperate soul, there is often more, and more often than not, those other desperate souls see the miraculous results of one person's request. You see, invariably, they ask questions. Word spreads. Before long, the original mortal realizes that they want more of Pazuzu's power, and when they call on him again, well, the results are just a little bit more twisted, a little more dark. Before long, the mortal has become a minion, and his neighbours, friends and family have flocked to his side, and the cult has formed. As the cult grows, Pazuzu's gifts grow more and more dark and sinister. He allows his minions to teach his name to key trusted cultists, and begins to grant them their own desires, often giving them the means to usurp command of the cult if the previous leader has displeased Pazuzu. Eventually, when Pazuzu judges his cultists have come to depend on him for success rather than on themselves, he reveals himself in his true might and horror. Those cultists who try to f- repent or flee, he just commands the faithful to hunt down, capture and bind. Pazuzu then demands a sacrifice, with the heretic's eyes and tongue plucked out, their body deeply lacerated by several severed vulture talons. They are then taken to a precipice or a well and thrown into it their final fall and life-quenching impact below, signifying their being cast out of the firmament into the putrid husk of the land below. Once the cult has committed its first sacrifices, Pazuzu leaves it to its own devices, seeking new prospects elsewhere. He rarely answers that cult's pleas again. Pazuzu cultists understand that once they've been accepted into the lower aerial kingdoms of their lord, they are expected to serve him, not be served. They spend the rest of their lives striving to please their master, converting new members, raising their families in their faith, until eventually they are sought out and destroyed by the forces of law and good. Bazuzu watches, not bothered by this in the least, as the righteous crusaders loot the bodies of his fallen cultists or rob his temples of their treasure. When they do, they learn his name. Time is on his side. Yes, it is. Now the last bit of law, as promised... Unlike other demon lords, Pazuzu has some very powerful allies, one which is very, very closely kept secret, and that is a very, very long time ago, using his ability to travel anywhere in the multiverse, Pazuzu went to the very heart of the abyss and took a sliver from the shard of ultimate evil. He then gave this to Asmodeus, who forged it into his ruby rod. Those few who know of this ancient deal believe that the king of hell has yet to repay Pazuzu for his favour. This is, of course, a bit of 4th edition lore, so I doubt many of you knew about that. I'll give it to you for free, though. (laughs) No strings attached. Enjoy. Plenty more where that came from. You know where to find me. Please hit the like button if you made it this far. Subscribe if you like what I do. Check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos. Buy some merchandise. Wear your geek with pride. And as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.